Um, so, my computer's been a little bit slow, sorry. Okay, so um, today I'm not gonna really talk about our things, um, even though this is the R club. Um, and that's because um, a few of you are starting to write papers and um, um, and um, I asked some of you to meet with Nick Eagles, who has um, recently written um, a paper, um, the Speakeasy paper. And then um, after that, we realized that maybe it was uh, good for me to try to give like an overview of how to um, organize things for a paper. Um, and so, um, so I'll talk a little bit about how to organize things, how to like, how, we like to keep track of figure files and all of that. And then a little bit of the tools that we use uh, from like Google Docs and LeapTech. Um, I always forget what's correct spelling. I think it's with a capital X. Um, um, yeah, it, it's a capital X. Awesome, thanks, thanks KJ. So let me fix it somewhere else. All right, so, um, oh, I didn't put the link to this, my bad. Um, let me do that right now. Uh -huh. All right. So, um, sorry about that. Um, so from the uh, Google spreadsheet for, um, uh, the club, you can find the link to, um, so this Google Doc that I like kind of started um, just a few minutes ago, but um, I'll probably add more links as we go through. Um, um, so the first thing is um, I've already talked a bit about how to write academic papers with Google Docs. So there is a little video over here, a um, well, little, I think it's like 40 minutes long, um, um, where this is from last year, um, um, where, um, um, I was basically like explaining some of these tools for, um, uh, that, this is, uh, sorry, let me mute that. Um, some of the tools that, uh, I like to use when writing Google, uh, academic papers with Google Docs. Um, so this video is like, you know, session like the one I'm doing right now. But um, you can find here the notes for that. Um, since then, though, this is a video from uh, April 6, 2020. Since then, um, I have 1000 Workspace, which is one of the tools I mentioned on that video, has been renamed as SciWheel. Um, that's because that F1000 um, like set of products got divided and some of them got sold off to a new owner. Um, and so that's why they decided to rename some things. And there's this blog post that I had officially contributed to them, I think 2019 or maybe 2018. I forget what year that is from. Um, so that is like, um, I won't go over all of that again, but it, it includes some of the tools that um, you could use for writing papers with Google Docs. Now a bit more general is like, okay, let, let's talk about paper organization, which doesn't really depend on whether you're using Google Docs, LaTeX, or Microsoft Word or any of that. Um, so the first question you should ask yourself is, do you have a journal in mind, right, for your manuscript? Um, and this can be tricky uh, because, um, um, like, sometimes you write the paper after you've done everything and you're ready to just publish it. Um, and at that point, you might have like a very specific journal in mind. Other times, you write in the paper as the project grows, right? And then um, um, you might change your mind of what is the journal you want to submit it to. So, in general, it's good to check the restrictions they have and the requirements they might have. Um, however, like um, many journals nowadays, not all of them, but many of them accept a PDF file in the initial submission. Um, as long as that PDF file like has like kind of like a common set of structure, right? Um, later on, once you submit it and then they send it to the reviews 
for the first round of reviews. And if they like your paper, then at that point, they'll ask you to, um, to, to change the formatting of your paper to fit the guidelines that they have. And so um, here is where like, if you use tools like the ones I talk about for Google Docs or LaTeX, it will simplify your life for actually reformatting things. Um, so one of the things they might ask you to, to change is like the citation style. Um, so, um, um, you know, some tools will help you with that. Um, if you do it manually, then anytime they ask you to reformat something, it's going to be like a ton of work, right? Um, if you manually write your bibliography, for example, or if you manually order your figures, uh, that will involve a lot of work later on because a journal can be like, hey, um, you have five figures, we only allow you to have four. Can you move one to the supplementary? And so at that point, you have to um, you have to uh, relink all the figure numbers, make sure that they're um, correct, right? So if you use tools for that, um, that will make your life easier. Um, they might also ask you to move things around, right? Um, and so let's say, um, you know, some journals might ask you to have the methods before the results, right? And, but then every journal will ask you that you reference the figures in the order that they appear on the paper. And so you're suddenly changing like a big block, block of text around, right? Then all, all the links and stuff have to, um, all the numbers will have to change, right? Um, so there's some tools that will make all of this like less painful. Um, um, although I would say that um, anytime you have to reformat something, it will be a little bit painful. And so, <clears throat> um, um, so for example, like um, a lot of papers we've written, uh, we've actually written them in Google Docs. Um, and then once we know what journal we're going to submit it to, we, we change the citation style to match the journal that they have in mind. And we try to follow the structure that they um, require even for that initial PDF submission. Um, although some details like, um, uh, like for example, if, if the figure number should be figure one versus fig.1, for example, some details like that we might change later. Okay. So um, one example I have here is Oxford Bioinformatics. And I'm including that one because we're actually writing a paper aim for that journal right now. And so if you access the journal website, right, uh, normally any journal will have fairly prominent on their menu a section for submitting. Uh, so here they have their author guidelines, which is what I'm looking at right now. And um, every journal will have different types of papers. Um, so first of all, you might want to check the scope, right? Like whether the paper you have in mind kind of fits uh, the categories of papers that they like to publish, right? Um, um, then, after, uh, then after that, you'll check the type of manuscript, right? And so in this particular journal, there's, there's a format called application notes, which is that the one I'm thinking of for a paper we're writing. Um, and so you can, um, they'll specify exactly like how many words you can have or how many figures you can have. Um, and so in this particular case, it's basically like a thousand words and one figure, um, which comes down to basically like two pages. Um, that's what this requirement that they have here. Um, so um, um, you know, that's something to keep in mind. You'll see, for example, here that they have a format free submission um, which is like you can, you know, um, submit it in any format, um, but they'll check the, the, the number of words and the figure and the length, right? And they're giving us some specifications about like what is the type of font, what type of um, spacing, et cetera, that you should have, right, for formatting, um, for that initial uh, formatting, uh, sorry, that initial submission. Um, so, <clears throat> Um, so let's say here, you know, we chose the application note as the potential paper we want to, you know, type of format we want to submit to. Another example is this BMC Bioinformatics Journal, um, where we have another paper that we actually submitted to. 
to here. And so again, this um, the journal website has some submission guidelines. Um, and in this part, you know, this case it's organized a bit differently, right? So they have uh, they they tell you like, okay, you want to understand how much it's going to cost to publish in this journal before you actually submit there. Uh, so this is maybe something more like the PI, the principal investigator or investigators um, might have to choose before they submit here. Um, and then they have here like general formatting rules for all article types. So that's the that's the next link that I included in, in the cool doc. Um, and so here they say like, oh, we have actually different types of papers. So, um, you know, the one we have in mind is a software article. Um, so I'll jump to that type of, um, of paper. Um, and so here they're a lot more specific about what you need to provide. So they say like, okay, you need to have a title page. You need to have an abstract maximum 350 words uh, that has actually these three sections, background results and conclusions. You have to have a keyboard section, um, um, uh, background implementation, results, discussion, conclusions. Then also you have to list the availability and requirements of your software. So you need to include like the project name, project homepage, operating system, et cetera. Um, um, then um, you might have to declare like, um, uh, well, I mean, you have to declare actually like ethics, consent for publication, availability of data, uh, competing interests, funding, not true contributions, acknowledgements, right? All of that. So this is you know, quite a long list of requirements. Um, and so um, we actually didn't read this when we submitted to this journal. And the first thing they replied was like, okay, can you, can you change your PDF to fit these requirements, right? Um, and so at that point, it feels like uh, you just got hit with like an extra amount of work, right? That you hadn't planned for. Um, um, and so if you already have the journal in mind, it might be good to like, you know, um, preemptively um, try to format your paper to fit the, what the journal is requiring you to, to do. Now, um, a lot of the formatting and structure and all of that can be a bit painful, but some of them have, um, some of these journals have LaTeX templates. Um, and so um, you, some of you might be writing your papers in Microsoft Word, right? Um, I personally avoid writing papers on Microsoft Word because um, um, they're not that easy to share, et cetera. Uh, I know that there's, you can use maybe the Microsoft Cloud now, um, or tools like that, uh, but um, you know, that's more recent. Um, so I either write papers on Google Docs because multiple people can edit the paper um, or LaTeX, which is a um, LaTeX, but hosted on Overleaf um, is kind of like the equivalent of Google Docs in the sense that multiple people can access the same file on the web, uh, but it uses this um, specific file format um, um, which um, LaTeX has been around since like computers had like, I don't know, 60 megabytes of RAM type of thing. Um, and the idea of LaTeX is that you focus on the content, not on the formatting of what you want to write. Someone else might write like, um, like a long piece of code to specify how the format should look like. Um, but the final author has to just mostly focus on the content. Um, so a lot of journals actually have templates on Overleaf. Um, so I put the wrong link here, the Zoom link. Um, so um, um, all right. Um, so let's look at this template from Overleaf. Um, so Overleaf as a website, when you access it over here on the top right, you can see that there's this templates button. Um, and there you can find a lot of journals. And so um, uh, 
someone else has coded all the formatting of how like you know the paper the, their journal likes to receive their papers etc so um if you have an overleaf account which you can make one for free um um you can then from the template you can either like let's say like download the pdf to just see how it looks check the source or you might you know just actually want to uh, open it so i'll open this template this will make a little copy of the project in my overleaf account um, um, and so I'm focusing on Overleaf today because um, for Google Docs, I already have another video for some of the tools. Um, and because some of you are writing your first papers with Overleaf and um, there's some questions about it. So I'm gonna make this big. Um, let me zoom in so you can see what we have here. Um, so <clears throat> the way Overleaf works right now is, um, we have on the left side, like a file browser. And there's a couple of different files that are already included uh, for this template to work. And we shouldn't really um, you know, delete any of them. Um, then on the bottom left, we uh, have the different sections of our paper and that we can like, you know, simply like left click on one of them and we'll jump to that section on the paper, right? On the middle panel, we have the text that goes, uh, that is the main thing that we're gonna be working on and editing. And then on the right side, we have the, a PDF of, um, of, the, um, of our manuscript. It has this nice feature by default where if you double click somewhere on the PDF, um, the, um, source panel will update uh, and will jump to that section of the paper. So let me see here if you, so here this is jumping to the specific part of where the figure is um, included. Um, and so a template like this will include like a bunch of random text and it will include examples of, for example, uh, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see this. Um, this template over here, includes like an equation at some point, different sections, probably the main sections you want to be using. We can see an example here of the text linking to this first equation. Um, um, uh, we can see a citation over here. Um, um, we can see a bulleted list, for example. Um, um, let's see what else we have. Uh, well, more sections, discussion, conclusion, um, um, acknowledgements, funding, et cetera. So this includes like a lot of the different parts of what your paper, you know, should have. We have an example of a figure, an example of a table, right? Now, um, LaTeX has a lot of different, um, um, you know, templates, etc. It has um, every template will have some different commands. Um, but let me explain it like a little bit the the overall structure of this. Now, um, I have to say that Overleaf now has also this rich text view, which um, if you don't want to deal with like a lot of the latex stuff, might be easier uh, because it tries to um, make it a little bit more readable. Um, I'm used to looking at the source, so that's why, um, I mean, basically that's why I'll show you a bit right now. Um, uh, but there's also that rich, rich text version. So LaTeX has a couple of things that are commands. A command starts with a um, backward uh, slash, then it has um, some options that are specified inside of curly braces. Um, like a, the, main, the main input for that command. Um, some commands have other options that you can include as a square bracket, um, or they might have like more than one set of inputs. So that will be multiple pairs of curly braces. Um, we can see here that we have the command for making the abstract section. Then um, inside of it, we have the motivation 
results and availability. So let me jump to the PDF version um, so we can see some of this. Like, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so we have here, right? Abstract, you know, motivation, results, availability, contact. So what I would recommend you do is like sometimes just delete a lot of like the text and start replacing like with uh, stuff you want to say, right? Um, 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 and that way, if you click over here in the top right, the recompile button, it will update the PDF and you can see like what has changed, right? Um, 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 so you can basically by like looking at the PDF, you can understand what a lot of these commands are doing. So this one is doing text in bold font, BF. Um, 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 we, can, we have this, for example, this citation over here, which is a citation in parentheses. Um, we're seeing that we're signing this paper called bag 01. Now, this is something that is not intuitive. And that is um, this bag 01 citation is defined on a different file. We're mostly looking at the main.txt file, but the citations are gonna be defined on this document.bib file. .bib stands for the bib text um, a file extension. And so let me here find, what was it? Um, I put it in um, bag 01, bag 01, oops, bag 01. So we can see here that we have in line 40 to 69, we have the citation information for this particular paper. And you'll see like, oh, you know, this looks like a complicated type of format, but actually um, many, uh, many tools. So like, let's see, like if I go to BioArchive, uh, let's look at uh, a spatial experiment, for example. Um, um, Biarca, for example, here under citation tools, uh, we can download the citation already in that format, which is this big tech format. Um, and then after that, you can simply like copy paste it um, into your um, overleaf. Um, so, um, so this template has a lot of stuff. And so let me jump into a different example um, this is actually the paper we're writing right now, um, this special LIBD paper. Um, and so this link won't, I'm giving you the, the public link where people can see, but not edit, I think. Maybe recognize it as my own account. Yeah, I recognize that it's my own account. Um, um, and so this might make it make more sense for um, uh, someone that is starting, right? Um, because you can see like an actual paper written, right? And compare what is the code that we're using for some of the things that we're doing and, um, and how it looks. One of the nice things is that you can have links. So here I'm linking to uh, a label that I call fig colon overview. And later on uh, we have, uh, I define the label here, fig overview. Um, and so this is something you can do with LaTeX, which is quite powerful. Um, this particular paper only has one figure, uh, but if you had more, right? Um, um, if you simply move around, the code for the figures is going to appear in different uh, uh, sections. Um, so I would say like this is like uh, the broad overview of, of LaTeX. Um, there's more commands, right? Um, uh, Overleaf has a pretty nice website explaining um, a lot of the LaTeX commands. But I, what I would recommend doing is simply Googling. You might like copy the name of the command, space LaTeX, and then just Google. And if, if there's a command that you are that you see someone else use and you're curious about what it's doing, right? Um, 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 at the end, for example, here, we could change the bibli bibliography style uh, depending on different styles that have been defined by journals. Uh, so this is like if you submit it to journal one, they reject it, then you want to submit it to journal two, you could always you know, update the citation style after that. Um, um, 
So that is a bit of the um, overview of, uh, of Overleaf and LaTeX. Um, now, um, I didn't include that, but let me um, jump to a different paper uh, that we have on Google Docs. Um, so let's look at, uh, um, 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 so I'll need to make a copy of this and send you the link later. Um, but this over here is our latest, like our, our um, facial transatomics paper from this year. I'm, I'm showing you this mostly because of the different things, uh, different sections of a paper that you have to consider, right? You'll have, you know, the title, all the authors. Um, you're gonna have to keep track of the full addresses for all the affiliations for people. This is something that is sometimes painful. And if you're requesting information from your co-authors, you might actually want to ask them for their email, the full address of their affiliation, including the zip codes and countries, um, and um, their org ID accounts, uh, because you'll need that information later on when you're submitting. Um, some, some journals also ask for titles for people. Um, um, so um, unless you're close to your co-authors, you might wanna ask well, what are their titles, right? If they're like a, a doctor, um, 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 I don't know. You know. People have different titles for what they had studied. Um, some journals here you have to include like um, um, who's gonna be the, uh, the person that you can contact um, then an abstract that like a lot of times, uh, we just check what it, what are the guidelines from the paper. Um, I like to include on Google docs, a little comment here saying like, oh, for the journal that we have in mind, it has to be less than, I don't know, 300 words or 250 words. Um, um, and so later on you can, um, uh, you can just, you know, select the text and use the tools from Google docs to, um, to, to check how many words you have. So this one is 146, and I'm, I'm betting that this particular journal um, asked us for a maximum of 150 words um, based on how many we have right now. You'll have your introduction. So in an introduction in, in the paper, you typically want to mention what other, other people in the field have been, have been doing and why is there a need for the type of project you've done. Um, depending on the length of the paper, the introduction might be shorter or longer. And then you're gonna have, you wanna give a little preview of what you did. Uh, for this particular paper, we have the results first and, and then the methods second. Um, and so I'm using tools um, for Google Docs that kind of basically do the same thing that uh, LaTeX can do, which is link to different elements on your paper. That way, if I change the order of let's say the figures um, then um, I can hit a little button and it will like automatically update all these pieces of text, uh, especially the numbers. Um, um, next, um, I mean, here the results, we have multiple subsections. Um, this is a pretty like longer paper uh, compared to the special IDB one. Um, um, so that's a lot of results. Um, Uh, mm -hmm. We have our discussion. So I don't normally include like, a conclusion and a discussion section. I only include one of them, right? Um, and so basically the first paragraph of, the, of a discussion is normally like kind of like your conclusion. Uh, and then on the discussion, you also want to highlight what are some of the limitations of the work that you have done. Um, but also you, you might want to include like a speculation of um, you know, inform a speculation of what you think that this work is going to, uh, um, of how this, how your work is going to influence the work of others later on, um, or the field, etc. Um, so this paper has a lot of this, like a very long discussion. Um, then after that, you're gonna want to include like how can uh, the data be downloaded by others. So here we have some accession codes. Um, 
you want to include the acknowledgements. And so this is a piece of text that, um, that depending on the project, um, you might have to double check with multiple people before you can write the acknowledgements. So you might have to ask um, for help um, across, um, yeah, multiple, you know, members of your team, or like we're talking about LIBD, um, you know, you might want to ask help from um, like Tom Hyde, for example, for some of the acknowledgements uh, that uh, we need to include, right? Some papers that, um, so for example, you're using the data from GTEx. GTEx on their uh, data use agreements require you to, to include like a long um, acknowledgement uh, paragraph, right? Um, so depending on what data you use, Sarah, this, the acknowledgements can actually take a while to write. Um, so you need to keep that a bit in mind. Um, funding, this is something that I didn't realize early on in my career, how important it was. Um, but basically like um, people that get grants, right? Need to write uh, um, uh, research progress reports to their, uh, the funding agencies. And one of the main things in, in, in a report like that is saying, what are the, um, the products that um, this particular grant was um, um, uh, like, uh, what are the products that were accomplished or completed thanks to the funding from that grant? And the way you do that is by like saying, like, okay, yeah, we did this paper. And if they check the paper, that paper actually includes the ID of the grant. Um, so this is very important for um, PIs. Um, um, and um, you, you, know, you, need, you need to be careful with this. You need to uh, make sure that all the grants that you need to cite are correctly cited, right? And so as your team gets bigger, you potentially have more and more grants to include, right? Um, um, and so this is something you know, like, I wouldn't leave it to the last minute. I would like make sure that you give people enough time to respond about the funding section uh, to make sure that they verify that like all their grants that they need to mention are included. Um, like um, um, sometimes people write papers because um, there's a deadline for, um, like maybe a journal has a call for papers and they need them by, I don't know, let's say, you know, Friday, 5 p.m., right? And so uh, I've seen it happen before where people are asking for um, comments on the paper like one or two days in advance. And at that point, you might focus on the science, but then forget about the funding. Um, um, and um, yeah, you want to make sure you don't upset anyone by not uh, mentioning in your grant or stuff like that. Um, um, then for author contribution, I like to use what's called the credit system. Um, credit. Um, 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 and a lot of journals um, have this. So let me include that link over here. It has a weird spelling. Um, and so this is like a, a group of people got together and defined different roles, different contributor roles for reasons why you're included as a co-author of a paper, right? And so um, um, they have all these roles, uh, conceptualization, which is like uh, thinking about what the project should be about data creation in case you like need to um, um, download data from the public and like label it uh, appropriately right a form of analysis which uh, that's basically what applies to a lot of us in over here which is like actually doing the, the analysis right the statistics writing code funding acquisition which is uh, self-explanatory investigation this one is a little bit weirder which, um, but it's like more broad um, um, so it's like, um, yeah, who, who was involved in the research or the research ideas, right? Methodology, which is like who developed methods, you know, project admin, 
resources. This is this can involve like people that created like um, like a website, for example. Um, software in case you develop software supervision for anyone that was managing others involved in the project um, validation in case you had to do like val ex experimental validation things like that visualization for some graphs then writing either the original draft or reviewing and editing um, so that's a lot of different roles right and you, you know people have more than one um, so this can also take a while um, and Let's say you're writing this, uh, you might um, want to double check with like the PIs that like um, that the different roles that you're suggesting for people are the appropriate ones. Um, um, so some people normally like the first authors have a lot, a lot of roles um, and the last authors also have a lot of roles. Um, and as you get to the middle section of the author list, they have less roles type of thing, right? Um, this is like, um, in general, this is like, I guess how credit works, right? Like people that worked more, right? Get um, um, uh, first author positions or last, right? Um, then you might have a declaration declaration of interest of people that were employees at companies or things like that. Um, this, I would like double check with the journal, how they want you to format this section. Um, and a lot of journals, Sadly, I don't like this, but sadly, a lot of journals want you to include the figures later on, not in as like as you go in the text. Uh, and so, um, in this particular case here, we have the different we have um, the images of the figures. We actually didn't include this um, um, in the very end. We had to like submit like figure files for each of the figures, uh, but here we have all the. Uh, um, all their captions and stuff. I like to have the title of the figure as the first sentence and put it in bold. I also like to use a bold font for any of the panels. So A, B, C, D, et cetera, uh, or one, two, three, or I one, I two, I three, um, just to make it easier for the reader to distinguish where um, does the description of a particular um, panel begin. Um, later on, if I need a reference to a, uh, to a previous panel, then I don't use the bold font anymore. Um, 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 so lots of figures here in this particular paper. Um, let me keep scrolling to all of that. Um, um, then the methods. And here, like this particular journal had a lot of uh, specific uh, requirements for the methods. Uh, so they wanted a section for contact for reagent resource sharing, another one for experimental model and subject details. Inside of it, we could have subsections, right? Or one of them they call method details, et cetera. And so in the methods, something that you wanna make sure that you're including is version numbers of everything. And that's why like one of the reasons why when we're writing our code, we wanna include the session information in our scripts. Um, um, and so you'll see here, like we're saying like, oh, we're using star version five, you know, 2.5.1b, right? Uh, the space ranger, the space ranger version 1.00, et cetera, because this information will be really useful for everyone else uh, who wants to try to reproduce your work. Um, and it's easy to forget that you need to keep track of all of this. And you might think that just mentioning that you're using star is enough. But that's not true. We know that like software changes a lot version to version. So you wanna be as precise as possible and keep track of that. Um, I also like to use <coughs> a different font style. So uh, for example, most of the paper here is written in the Arial font, uh, but then uh, for <coughs> names for software, um, I like to use Career New. Career New is a font that uses equal spacing for all of the letters and uh, numbers. Um, so any function name here, I'm using that, that type of font uh, to make it easier to distinguish what is um, um, like a piece of code or like software names here are, are idolized, for example. And so it, it takes a lot of work to keep track of all the different versions of the main packages that you use for your analysis, right? So, you know, version 1.8 here, 1.14.3 here. And 
because some projects take a long time to complete, you might actually have a section of your project that uses, let's say, Scran version 1.14.3, and then later on you have another section that maybe uses Scran version 1.16, right? Um, so um, it's not that obvious to keep, you know, to remember um, what are all the versions of things you use. Um, um, so writing the methods section like takes a lot of extra information, right? You need to remember what are the functions, the packages, the versions. You need to cite all the tools that you're using, right? Um, 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 uh, it's a common mistake that people don't cite the methods. Um, and that is like detrimental for everyone in the community because then the people writing methods um, have a harder time justifying their careers, right? Um, and then if there's less methods then there's less things for you to use later on. So it's very important to cite every method. Uh, as a method developer myself, right? I try to make sure I do that. Um, um, cool. So lots of methods here. It's a pretty long paper, this one in particular. Um, um, some journals will ask you to include like, what are the type of tests that you've done? What, what is the information that you show in the box plot, for example? So we're showing the median, interquartile range, et cetera. And that's because in, years, in recent years, there's been a strong push to um, be as, um, uh, as clear, clear as we can be on the statistics, right? So um, uh, don't assume that people know what your plot is showing. So um, this, in this particular case, we for, we didn't think about doing this while we were writing the paper and we had to do it later. And it was kind of painful to go back and remember like, okay, you know, what it, what are all the settings we use, et cetera. Um, um, but if you, if you keep track of this information as you're writing it, right? So for example, like you might do a t-test, but it, you have to say whether it's a two-sided t-test versus a one-sided t-test, et cetera. Um, 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 mm -hmm. Code availability. So I normally like to include the GitHub links. Um, uh, but you'll notice here that the code in, uh, the code has citations here. And that's because you can get, for any GitHub uh, repository, you can get a DOI, a digital object identifier through a service like Zenodo. Um, and so that will make your code permanently available for others. And that's why do you want to do that? Because if you just include the GitHub link, some in the future you could just as easily delete your GitHub code, right? However, if you put it on Zenodo, you can't just delete it, right? Um, so this makes it more permanent, and that's why you get that dig digital object identifier. Um, so every every GitHub repository, you're gonna have to like get a Zenodo link for it, etc. Um, all the different codes. Then here there's a ton of supplementary information. This paper has, I don't know, 28, I think, figures, uh, something like that. Um, all the different tables. Um, what else am I missing? Um, okay, the citations at the end. All right. Um, well, so you can see a paper involves a lot of different pieces and you can make your life easier by keeping track of things as, you, as you're doing it, right? As you're writing your paper. So, uh, and as you're doing the analysis, like I mentioned about the versions of software. Um, and some people like to actually write the method section of the paper one uh, of not even the full methods, just the methods paragraph for the analysis that, that you did immediately after doing the analysis, because then, then you have in mind like exactly what are the R versions, et cetera, that you used, right? Um, and like right now it's more like a, a short paragraph, a paragraph of the methods could take you like an hour to write. Um, so um, uh, when you, you know, when someone says like, hey, like, can you write this paper, you know, this weekend type of thing, right? It's not possible. It's impossible to write a paper in a, in a, <coughs> in a very short amount of time. Uh, 
because of how much information you need to like gather from multiple places. Um, okay, what else did I want to mention? Um, oh, I wanted to talk about figures. So um, I don't have a public link for something like that yet, but let me open um, my Dropbox here. So we have typically like to use Dropbox, um, although internally we're thinking maybe we should start using um, 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 other tools. So we like to make a little Dropbox folder where everyone has access to it. Um, where we're gonna keep track of all the figures and supplementary tables for the paper. Inside of it, we like to make a little folder for every submission. You're gonna have multiple rounds of submissions. So in this case, for the spatial IBD paper, I don't actually know how to increase the font here. So you can uh, uh, see it bigger. But anyway, um, um, we have submission zero one. Actually, let me do this through the terminal. Um, there I can increase the font. All right. right. Um, so here we have that uh, submission zero one folder. Um, inside of that folder, um, in this particular case, we only have like a couple of figures. So we made a one folder uh, per um, per figure. Um, so this is a kind of a simple scenario. Let me go and show you a more complicated one. Uh, um, so here, um, a special DLPFC, which is that bigger paper, we have four uh, submission uh, directories. So we go look at the first one. Um, we'll notice here that we have um, a directory for the main figures, uh, another one for the all the manuscript files, another one for the supplementary files, supplementary tables, etc. And so if I go to the main figures one, um, oh, actually, let me go to figure pieces. Um, so <clears throat> what I did here is um, uh, we have all the different, a folder for every single figure, but then there's also like a, a little um, underscore, um, so, sorry, we have like figure one underscore and then overview. So we have a little piece of text here after the underscore and you can have multiple underscores. And here I'm not using any spaces in the directory names. Now, why am I doing that? That's because when I um, use the tools from Google Docs, um, so let me try to find um, here. So you can notice that on the Google Docs, uh, I'm labeling my link to that first figure as um, um, pound sign fig, which is the key code for figures on the score. And then I hear it shows the same name overview. And so that's how I can keep track of, um, of all the, you know, what figure files correspond to, to something on the Google Docs. Um, and this is particularly useful for projects like this that have a ton of figures. Um, so I can remember what are the internal links that I'm using on Google Docs. And the same thing can happen if you're using LaTeX, right? On LaTeX, we, we saw that we could have uh, um, um, you can define a label, for example, here, I call it overview, um, and then you can reference it using the ref command. Um, um, like I did here, ref, uh, curly brackets, uh, feed, two dots, um, sorry, call an overview. Um, so that's why I like to keep those names like that. Um, and so inside of one of these files in these directories, we'll have like, um, let's say all the, you know, PNGs and PDFs or whatever that we're using. Um, 
And uh, we might also have, uh, here I have this um, Illustrator file that combines all the different um, uh, uh, panels of that plot and makes it into, into a single figure. Um, um, so this is how I like to keep things organized because otherwise you're gonna have a single folder. Like if you just had a figures folder, you would have a, a ton of different PDFs, a ton of different PNGs and panels. And it just makes it hard to keep track of, of what, um, what are the pieces that you're using for each of your figures. Um, eventually this project, we had to reorganize it a little bit, but um, that's because some of the general specifications, but um, um, this is what I like to do. So if, if I go back to um, the special uh, LIBD paper, right? Um, you only have submission zero one right now. Um, so if I go to figure one here, we'll see that I have, I um, mean, here we're using some logos that are uh, PNGs or um, JPEG files, um, et cetera. And eventually have my, you know, my uh, illustrator file. And I created both the uh, EPS and PDF versions of that. Um, uh, anything that you do with R, you try to save it as a PDF, uh, unless it's like really, really big, uh, just because if you do that, it's gonna be vectorized graphics. Um, and that way you can like make it bigger or smaller as you want. Um, so I'm actually in the process of uh, making sure everyone in, in the team has Illustrator accounts. So you'll be able to do things like this for your papers. Um, and Illustrator is particularly useful because um, um, you can add a little different um, A, B, C, Ds, et cetera. Um, you can add a little colors. Um, you can link to files such that um, if the input file for one of the panels changes, your Illustrator file will automatically update. So um, try to zoom in more. Um, so let's say I change the PDF that is the input for this panel. It will automatically uh, get updated later on um, uh, if I change that input PDF. And you might wanna do that because I don't know, let's say you decide to change the colors of that panel, right? Things like that. Um, um, so, uh, I would say our use of Illustrator is fairly basic and you can actually do a lot of these things with like, uh, for example, you can do use Patchwork, the R package, R, R package for doing it. But um, um, I found it easier to do stuff like that, like this. Um, you could also go into Illustrator or Adobe Acrobat and like manually edit um, text. So for example, this panel here had something else that I deleted manually on, on the title. Uh, you can try to increase the font sizes of, of, of um, your um, axes, et cetera. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I would say that's basically all the tricks and things I use. Um, and so let me stop recording. Mm -hmm.